So moving on to our next slide, what I'm proposing in my book and in this talk is not a replacement for other therapies. It's something that's additive that you could maybe bring in. And it's definitely not any kind of magic wand. It's a sort of complementary. And it's going to mean a, a de-emphasizing some aspects of the therapy. So here's a list of things that I would say might be de-emphasized. And in my experience, this makes our jobs a lot easier. Um, in this approach, we don't worry so much about analysis and detective work or figuring out the problem. We don't try to figure out the cause as much, like uh, every cause has preceding conditions. Any one cause to state, you know, I have this problem because of that event is probably a bit of an oversimplification. The labeling of conditions is going to be reduced. Uh, pathological interpretations, that is, this is bad, these uh, sort of value judgments around behavior. We're going to instead try to look at all behaviors as efforts of the autonomic nervous system to survive. Even if they're horrific behaviors, they were arising from some underlying motivation of survival. And Alice Miller's material is excellent in this area. She studied the great villains of history and showed how, you know, badly they were treated in their childhood. And um, the ACE studies is another good example. Um, in this uh, approach, we're going to have uh, a constant uh, emphasis on autonomy. We're going to be really trying to keep the client looking to develop their inner resources, and get back on their own two feet, and not become overly dependent on us as therapists. Um, we're going to hold the possibility that they that this could be something they could do in a period of time. It doesn't mean forever. And, of course, they could continue to have support forever, but they want to have the ambition that they could recover their autonomy, their wellness, uh, in a reasonable amount of time, sort of an emphasis on therapeutic efficiency. Um, in this approach, we're going to be have less catharsis, as Peter Levine has guided us, we're going to be uh, reducing any separation of the rest of their life from the process. That is, what's going on in your life and what was happening in your life at the time of the first symptoms is going to be a pretty common question and a pretty uh, common aspect of the whole thing. Then uh, also we're going to have relationships are going to move to the foreground. In my experience, what's happening in relationships has a really big impact. So, for instance, a person comes in, they're anxious or depressed. At some point in the first 10 minutes, I'll probably be asking them, tell me about your relationships. What's going on in your relationships? Because that goes back to the energy model that if they're in a, uh, for instance, if they're married or they have a boyfriend or girlfriend, and if that's not going well, then the fundamental uh, polarity dynamics, the sun and moon in the relationship is going to be creating stress. And it's like having a pebble in your shoe. A person comes in with a limp and you can give them treatment to reduce the limp and they feel better, but unless you take the pebble out of the shoe, they're going to start limping again as soon as they're walking around. So in this approach, we're going to be, uh, you know, really elevating relationships and helping people see how important that is. And then lastly on this short list of sort of a general orientation to the method is going to be a separation of mind and body is going to be de-emphasized. That is, if it's happening physically, it's probably preceded by something mentally. If it's happening mentally, it's probably followed by something uh, physically. The gestures are meaningful of the body. The locations of illnesses are not random. 
and ideas of this nature all derive from um, Oriental philosophy and healthcare systems. So then um, that sort of gives us a general idea of where we're going. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to turn to some applications from the book and, um, and discuss each one of these a little bit. Um, the uh, attachment wounds using this method are going to have five key features. And those are, first of all, we're going to focus on the present more than the past. So it's not necessarily going to be about excavating all the bad things that happen. And in particular, we're going to use Peter Levine's method, which we have used the term body low, slow loop, which I'll discuss just shortly. And uh, we're going to use Peter Levine's method to start to get some pendulation or oscillation, movement from pole to pole in the present, in the body. And that's somewhat separated from the context. And uh, this allows us to um, really cut to the heart of the autonomic aspect, not the cognitive aspect, but the autonomic aspect. And then I'm going to be describing for you the two-chair method with whoever they have in their life in the present. And the two-chair method, you see the note below, is really gestalt plus three. It's... Uh, Fritz Perls uh, made popular the term gestalt as a ref reference to a two-chair method, which he did not invent. He picked it up. It was 10 years old at the time he picked it up. But um, we're going to add somatic experiencing from Peter Levine, uh, the ancient wisdom cosmology, this whole idea of a polarity field or expansion-contraction cycles, and then we're going to add energy anatomy and body reading, including the autonomic nervous system. Each one of these is the topic of a separate chapter in the book. And I won't try to go through all that because I want to get to some um, practical examples. But um, but those are uh, you know, that's our number two, our two chair method. I use it a lot. I was. Uh, Starting in the 70s, that was my training initially coming into this field, and it just works. It works very, very well. I'm uh, I'm just uh, so enthusiastic about it, and with these added dimensions, I think it's um, just very, very effective. And uh, we've I've worked with Diane. Uh, you know, we've discussed this quite a bit, and she's observed some examples and things like this, uh, really confirming how compatible that method is with her ideas. Then next, third on our list, we're going to hopefully have enough time here and discuss the boundary practice with the imagined parents. It's been my experience that attachment wounds are um, often accompanied by what we call boundary problems. Now, the boundary is referring to kind of a invisible aura or a shell or a surrounding field about arm's length outside the body. And when we have attachment wounds, we very often find um, boundary problems. So I, uh, this is something people can start to work on. They can do it as a guided visualization, and I'd like you to be familiar with it, you know, by the end of this call. Um, then let's see next is going to be depathologize the attachment strategies I find so many people feel so bad about whatever they category they have been uh, decided that they are in for example um, I had a client he had learned that he was an avo avoidant attachment style and he felt a bit disarmed just by the labeling of it. So the uh, we're going to depathologize that. We're going to say, well, you know, yes, avoidant attachment style is a real thing, and that, but let's not make it so hard and fast. Let's soften it up a little bit, 
And let's appreciate that that arose out of real conditions. And in the context of those conditions, it actually was a intelligent strategy to get, uh, you know, to survive in a difficult situation. And um, I've done this a lot. I find this is helpful. People relax a little bit. They don't feel quite their um, sort of uh, resigned to a doomsday kind of a scenario when they feel like they ha actually there was an intelligence behind it and they're not so uh, fixated in the category. And then <clears throat> lastly, we're going to talk about identifying and resolving present day binds. So often, a person may be somewhat functional in their life or even highly functional, and then in a certain context, they will go off. And all of a sudden, things are not working so well, their relationship is falling apart, and so on. So in this approach, we're going to really help them. It's almost like a life coach a little bit. Tell me what's happening in relationships, how's things going at work. Let's figure out if there are active binds in your life, let's see what we can do to relieve those. And then we'll come back around to the therapeutic process for the attachment wounding. And um, I found that to be effective. We can sort of defuse some of the charge if we can uh, uh, find some way to resolve some of the binds. Let's go into the first one. And... Um, this is called Body Low Slow Loop, and this is our attempt to, and when I say our, I'm referring to myself and my wife, Anna. Um, this is our attempt to really simplify uh, essential uh, level of uh, somatic experiencing into something that's uh, memorable and relatively easy to um, for a person to do and for them to do on their own. They don't necessarily uh, have to be in the presence of a guide. We have uh, put on the Internet several versions of this for um, that are audios. They're 12 and 13 minutes long, and those are free. So if you have, if you want to try it yourself in a guided version or if you have a client that wants to try it, they can just go on energyschool.com under resources, under podcast, and pull down. Uh, there's three versions, one for therapists and one for clients, and then a second one for clients as well. And I'd like to actually do this if you're up for it. And if you're not, you can just listen in. But if you are, and especially if you have a speaker phone, we'll just do one round of body low, slow loop so you can get an idea of what the experience of it uh, actually is. And uh, so for that purpose, if you're uh, participating, and if you're not, that's fine too. But if you're participating, I just invite you to bring your awareness into the body. And just notice the sensations that are present. And among the sensations, there's always gravity. So that's your contact with whatever surface. For instance, a chair, a couch, or the floor. Just feel that contact the density of the floor, the thickness of the carpet, the temperature, the distribution of contact. Sometimes we're leaning to the left or the right. Perhaps there's a backrest. These are all interfaces with gravity. And we're allowing the sensation level of perception to come to the foreground. Naturally, there's always thoughts and feelings as well, but just now we let the sensations, whatever is present, then we could progress it a little bit. We could just notice the breathing. 
just like gravity is always present, breathing is always present. If we don't have gravity or breathing, we've got a problem. So just notice the belly is moving, the ribs are moving. So this checks the first box, body. And then we can progress it just a little bit. Now, if you would, whatever is present, for instance, you may be noticing your seat or your breath, or maybe you have a sore throat today or a little, uh, you know, uh, rumbling in the stomach or, uh, uh, you know, a sore muscle from when you were uh, exercising earlier. Just whatever is comes to the foreground, see if you can figure out the lowest border of that sensation cluster. And this then is going to click the second box. So in my case, I'm noticing my throat. I've been talking a lot. So I just try to figure out how low can I notice that sensation. And it's a little below the collarbones for me just now. So just really notice as if you're kind of figuring out the lower border. And then next, we can progress it a little bit. With the primary sensation, let's ask ourselves three questions. Is it more on the left or the right? Or is it right in the middle? Is it more shallow or deep? Is it moving or still? And for each of these, you have a, you know, you have an opinion. You have something uh, that you arrive at as a, as an impression. And this checks the third box. And then now, we bring in Peter Levine's great discovery. And if you would, please take your attention down to the feet and wiggle your toes against whatever surface is nearby, moving your feet, feel the texture of your socks or the floor, notice every detail as if you're a student, a scientist, studying sensory nerve signaling from the feet. And then with the toes, just count off on one foot. One, two, three, four, five. And on that same foot, go around. There's the ball of the foot and the heel the arch, having a complete experience and then now if you would let's bring your attention back up into the body where you were originally. And just notice what's present there now. So that's one cycle of body low, slow loop. And perhaps, as uh, many of you can report, you'll notice that it's a little different when you come back to where you were originally. And this is Peter Levine's basic idea, that we have a complete experience of state A, which is the main torso area, because autonomically that's the top priority. 
and then we go away from that somewhere else. We're choosing the feet, but we could use the fingertips, either one, because those are lower priority autonomically. And then we come back. It's as if the pendulum has been artificially moved from state A to state B and back. Each one of these, body, low, slow, and loop, is countering one of the main features of trauma. In trauma, we go out of the body and we go out of the present into the past or future. In trauma, we go up with our alarm and orient responses. This brings us back down. In trauma, we everything speeds up. Whereas when we ask detailed questions, it causes a person to pause because they really have to think a little bit to come up with an answer, more left or right. And then the magic is in the fourth one, the loop. Go away and then come back. Reestablishes polarity movement and counters trauma's tendency towards fixation. I have had people use this. I tell them do it uh, once a day at least for 10 or 15 minutes. A good time to practice this is right before sleep. Um, they're lying in bed. They can do a body low, slow loop, and they'll end up fast asleep. It's a good way to gradually, non-cognitively reintroduce movement to the autonomic nervous system. Help a person autonomically, not cognitively, autonomically realize that there are other options. We're not just habitually stuck in state A. So I recommend that one for you, Body Low Slow Loop. Please give it a try. You can read a multi-page uh, description of it in the book. You could download the um, guided versions. It's my voice, um, you know, giving in different classes where it happened to be audio recorded. So that's number one of our little uh, set. And we have a little more time. Let's carry on. We'll go to number two. And this is called the resonance practice. And here are the instructions. We won't actually do it just now because of our time. Uh, but I recommend you could read about it. It's on page 195. And it's a way to exercise the self-other, the self-other spectrum. In the early days of attachment theory, such as the 1990s, the um, self-other was considered to be the great continuum. And the original phrasing of avoidant and ambivalent was uh, all around whether the person had, was more at ease with focus on self or more at ease and focus on other. So this is a practice done in pairs in which people can uh, artificially uh, start that pendulum swinging from pole to pole, expansion, contraction, uh, other, self, and they do it by reporting and listening, alternating each one. And there are many good variations that are discussed in the book. For example, it's very useful to make the reporting part about the contact with the floor. And it's very use, useful to make the listening part when you're in other mode to add a thought of appreciation as part of your listening. And we have had excellent, excellent results with this, even in very large groups. It's a way for people to settle, to build their social autonomic nervous system function, and to if they've been stuck in self, we call that narcissistic, or if they've been stuck in other, we call that codependent. It's a way to artificially get the energy moving from pole to pole, reinduce movement. Very effective, excellent with couples. So then, let's see, I'm just going to move one more 
and I'd like to tell you about the boundary practice. I mentioned it earlier. This is a self-help method for people with uh, uh, traumas, but this is particularly, I think, effective for um, developmental trauma. Um, it has three steps, and the idea is first we're going to visualize a surrounding field, a shell or a bubble or an aura, and uh, we're going to visualize its condition. And most people are able to report with great precision the condition of their boundary. That is, they'll say, oh, it's good on the front right, but the back is just crowding me, totally pressed up against me, and the left is non-existent. And, uh, you know, we could make all kinds of interpretations about early childhood experiences where the uh, problem had a spatial dimension to it. And... Uh, uh, that's rich territory. For example, I had one person who had uh, no boundary at all. It was just zero in the left front quadrant. And as it happened, when they had a major event in their life, it came from that exact direction. And Diane tells a story in her book about how a uh, Insurance company sent her a client who had had multiple accidents all coming from exactly the same direction. And she was actually blind in that direction. She could not, you know, her boundary was not functioning in that particular zone. So inspection, then repair. Uh, this is all done through the imagination and visualization. It's done repetitively. Uh, but we take whatever materials we can dream of and we imagine that we are repairing our boundary to an optimum state where it's equal distance from the body and it's nice and well uh, fortified, it's strong, with the understanding that inside the boundary is our safe space. The world can carry on as it likes outside, but on the inside we have safe uh, choice in the present. We can choose who could come in or who would not. And so it's very methodical. They just repair, 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 going around, starting in the front, going around the back, coming around the other side, repairing the boundary. And this is done repetitively, so the next day they could do the same thing again, and they will probably pick it up from where they left off. That is, they'll develop certain pattern and familiarity with it, and that will really help. Because all the time they're building a safe space for themselves, non-cognitively, they are tuning in to what safety actually feels like, and their autonomic nervous system is learning that safety is actually possible in the present. And then the third step is very important, is rest. Once the repair is complete, Imagine resting inside the boundary. And I do this with clients. I have them just really get comfortable in their uh, favorite easy chair in their imagination, lean back, really rest, and enjoy the feeling of being inside a safe space in the present. And sometimes they report that maybe their parents fought a lot, and they can still hear outside the boundary the imaginary sounds of conflict, but it's all kind of muffled because now they have a safe space for themselves. And people have reported very, very good effects uh, using this. So let's see, one more. I gave you a slide from um, 1998 just giving you a little background on this self-other concept. We won't spend time on that, but uh, it just gives you a little historical view of where attachment categories, uh, you know, what it looked like 15, 20 years ago. It's very interesting, I think, uh, for this class. And uh, Diane and I were discussing it recently, so I wanted you to have a picture of it. So then lastly, um, 
uh, would like to just give you a brief uh, sample of what a two-chair process would look like. And um, in this example, the, um, it was the the lady, it was her, I think, second session, she was having um, uh, onset of anxiety and self-doubt, insecurity, low self-esteem, a relationship uh, breakup that was addressed in the prior session. And um, so I chose let's have her in one chair and let's – we did body low, slow loop to get her settled and get her in a uh, autonomic equilibrium. And then in the empty chair, facing chair, we imagine that her father was sitting there. And uh, immediately she had a physical response to the imagined presence of her father. We titrated that, worked with that using body low, slow loop and similar methods. And then it became time that she could actually talk. She, uh, in essence, had these types of comments about his negativity and his anger. And then she could switch and be imaginarily in dad. Be dad. And with no obligation to reality, dad is deceased. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything was ever said or that ever will be said. But you can see how a conversation gradually develops, and with some support, he finally got it. The effect, and this is not really him necessarily, it's actually the uh, sort of subliminal or the secondary part of her own autonomic nervous system. And we're artificially inducing pendulation from state A, which is the, you know, the victim, to state B, the perpetrator, in order to get some flow going from pole to pole following the energy anatomy model. And you can see how it goes on from there. Finally, he cops to his mistreatment, and his body shows that. He slumps, and then he apologizes, and then switching back over, she is in the first chair, and she feels waves of energy sensations in the body. She sighs. She can feel energy descending in the body, which is a good sign autonomically, and uh, you know, I'm not crazy after all. She starts breathing more deeply after all those years, not talking about it, but she was right. Her perception was right. We did body low, slow loop one more time to help her get through it. And then we switched back over to dad again, and this is just the pendulum going from pole to pole. The content doesn't actually matter quite as much as the autonomic shift, the physical sensation changes of state. And um, he becomes more realistic. He'd be very apologetic. He offers, is there anything I can do to make up, which is a uh, sort of a protocol within the polarity model. And he, she says, well, you can talk to mom, because she was the real victim in the whole thing. Switches back over. And as dad, he imagines mom is in the other chair. And then switch back as mom, she just goes off. She's like a volcano of all this pent-up anger. And, uh, of course, mom is not there. Dad is not there. This is just all the inner remobilization of the polarity dynamics within the client. And uh, so mom gets to say her piece. Dad gradually is able to take it in. Um, and goes back, we see her again, and she um, uh, now has a much bigger picture of the whole thing. And she reports, I ask her, you know, uh, you know, can you forgive your father at this point? And what number would you give? She said, I can, because we use a, a numeric scale, it really helps. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that that I won't go into now, but it's discussed in the book. And she said, well, in terms of forgiveness, I'd say I'm up to about a five. But in terms of relief, I'm a ten. And uh, we were coming to the end of the session, and she uh, 
her anxiety and her restlessness and all that she reported was just greatly relieved. And I heard from her the next day when she uh, sent me her notes. I often ask the clients to please write down notes for these things. She reported, that was great. I feel way, way better. And so we didn't actually have to figure out all the analytical aspects. We were able to approach it autonomically. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sample of some of the applications. There's lots more where these came from, but uh, that'll get you started. And um, I would just like to, once again, if we could, return to any questions. We have five minutes or so left, and I'm eager to get any anything I can answer. And you can always follow up with me individually as well or on Facebook. In the body slow, the body low slow loop exercise, does the first sensation have to be one in the trunk so that there's a pendulation when one takes her action towards the feet? Uh, no. Any place will do. Whatever is present is fine. Any place will do. The trunk autonomically is programmed as mission critical. The periphery is programmed as less important. So, for instance, if you were attacked by a predator, you would naturally raise your arms and feet without thinking about it. Because if you got nicked on the hand or the foot, it wouldn't matter so much. But in the throat or the torso, it could be very serious. So very commonly in working with trauma, the uh, phenomenon that appears in the foreground is often in the trunk. And to go to the periphery is beneficial. That's going to be a, a clear uh, that and not that. That's a Zen saying, that and not that, to get a pendulation going from state A to state B. That's the whole purpose of it. So very often it will relate head and trunk versus periphery, core versus periphery. But it doesn't have to be. It could be even left hand, right hand. And that's a whole exercise in the book. It can be top, bottom, front, back, inside, outside, anything where you're getting artificially induced pendulum swinging from one location to a different location. That's what's doing the work autonomically.